we know that there were talks in December last year, they were talking about this conflict in Ukraine. If they want to do a serious talk on Ukraine, why they don't invite Russia to be part of these talks? Well, uh, let's start from the beginning. Uh, first of all, what is Zelensky formula? Well, he wants Russia to return uh, the lands that are now part of the Russian Federation. Um, based on a legal process that included a public referendum that overwhelmingly voted in favor of these regions joining Russia. The first one in Crimea was held uh, um, almost ten, almost a decade ago. Um, and then there were recent referenda in four other regions that are now part of the Russian Federation. Returning them to the Ukraine, if such a thing were ever to happen, would violate Russian constitution and would be an act of treason on the part of Russian officials who would agree to, to such an action. Therefore, it would never happen. So much for the Zelensky formula. Now, um, as far as what is actually going to happen, you know, Russia at some point is going to uh, dictate the terms. Uh, which territories it wants, which territories it doesn't want. Um, we'll probably hold public referenda in those territories, and by uh, by popular demand, these territories will also join the Russian Federation. I don't know what else there is to discuss. I think that this is basically um, a sort of you know phantom limb flailing on the part of of the West. Uh, and um, a futile effort to pull the Global South into this discussion, which has led to nothing exactly as expected. Since this war started, they thought that the Global South would get along with their policy against Russia, but it didn't work for them. Why they're trying to invite Global South for this negotiation? Are they trying to convince these countries to put some sort of pressure on Russia? Well, yes, they've, they basically aren't able to accept to take no as an answer um so basically they they um they put themselves in that uncomfortable situation over and over again where they get together and they make their statement and uh, the answer is no and they scratch their heads and they they try again this really has to do with their psychological makeup not with any part of uh reality as it now exists. Basically, the Americans who are in charge of the whole thing, uh, it would be a mistake to consider uh, Europe as any sort of part of it. Um, they're not partners, they're vassals. Uh, but the Americans basically practice a very st strange sort of diplomacy where they, they state their demands. If their demands aren't met, they impose sanctions. If their sanctions don't work, um, then they uh, they move on to uh, a bombing campaign or something, some military action. Except sanctions against Russia only help Russia, and military action against Russia would be a suicidal move. So they're stuck in 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 at at step one, which is make their demands. And it doesn't work, so they make their demands again. And it doesn't work, so they make their demands one, once again. Because they aren't programmed for anything else. They're like broken robots at this point. So I think that that's what's going on. How do you compare Soviet Union to Russia? How Soviet Union couldn't overcome its difficulties, and Russia now is overcoming these difficulties that they're having under sanctions? Well, I think that there, there are basically a few different elements that are quite disparate. The first one is that uh, the United States and Europe, to some extent, um, profited a great deal from the collapse of the USSR. Basically, they, uh, they looted uh, the remnants. They weren't able to completely loot Russia, but they completely looted um, many of, of the, the Soviet socialist republics. The Ukraine especially has been pretty much denuded of, of its uh, Soviet era industry. All of that has been uh, created up and shipped out um, so that the Ukraine now has no industry to speak of. 
And uh, the thinking is that now that the cupboard in the West is bare again, it's time to do this again, except to Russia, since the Soviet Union no longer exists. Break up Russia into little pieces and loot the pieces and and basically have this, you know, Moscow, the Kremlin remain, the Moscow region, maybe some other regions remain as Russia, and the rest of it made into these insignificant little fiefdoms uh, separately controllable by the West. But that's not destined to be, and, and so that's, a, you know, basically all futile. Now, as far as NATO expansion, uh, basically everything that they do is, um, is predicated on the idea of making profits from military spending. So anytime that NATO expands, some uh, little country has to modernize its forces and, and spend a great deal of money on purchasing uh, NATO weapons. And NATO weapons happen, happen to be uh, mostly American weapons. You know, there's a little bit of German, a little bit of French, a little bit of Swedish, but uh, the vast majority of the weaponry is made in the United States. And, and uh, profits, the military industrial complex, um, and the congressional military industrial complex, which is what a lot of people these days uh, call it, because the Congress, the US Congress is part of it, the whole corruption scheme where there are kickbacks for military spending that is used to finance ele electoral campaigns for the US Congress. So basically that's the plan. That's why they, they eat up little countries like Montenegro, like, um, like Finland, uh, because basically not doing so means to them leaving money on the table. Um, why would they do that? Uh, they, they see the money and they go after it. It doesn't really have to do anything with uh, with defeating Russia because that's an an, an impossibility in any case. Uh, but it is an annoyance as far as the Russians are concerned. So, for instance, now that Finland is part of NATO and is destroying itself economically as a result, um, the Russians have to uh, put together uh, an entire um, military force in in the north of the country. Um, that is uh, going to quote unquote defend it against uh, against the Finns, or more likely dissuade the Finns from doing anything. Although the Americans might still force the Finns to do something or other, um, just to to justify spending money on on the military. Um, it's all rather sad and futile, but it it is really this unstoppable urge to make money off of war uh, that's at the heart of it. How do you find right now the economy of European countries, especially Germany? It seems that Germans are preparing to fight with Russia. It's so bizarre that they're thinking that Russia is their enemy. Well, it does make sense because uh, American occupied territory, Germany is not a sovereign nation. It has um, American uh, armed forces stationed on its, so its soil. And it, it can't really do anything. It can't pursue an independent foreign policy. Um, it can't elect leaders that are not vetted by the CIA. Uh, everything that is published in the German press has to be approved by CIA censors. Uh, that's why the Germans call their press Lügenpresse, the, the lying press. So saying that Germany wants to do something or does something or, or intends to do something, um, it, in translation, that means Americans are pretending that Germany wants to do that thing or intends to do that thing. Um, it, Germany as, as a sovereign nation does not exist. Uh, now, as far as the economy, um, German industrial production peaked, I believe, in 2008 and has been declining ever since. And uh, now that uh, the Americans have cut off the supply of Russian natural gas and many other products to the German industry, German industry is shutting down to, to some extent, laying off workers. Uh, it is unlikely to ever recover. 
uh, the Americans are doing it for, um, you know, two reasons, one completely misguided and one not so misguided. The completely misguided reason is uh, they were thinking that this would hurt Russia um, because it, it would no longer be able to trade with the with the Germans, with the European Union. Well, well, Russia just turned around and started exporting to other parts of the world. And and because of these disruptions, the price of prices of energy went up. And so Russia ended up making more money by exporting less energy. So uh, what's not to like as far as Russia is concerned? So this, the slightly less misguided reason from the American point of view is that uh, they get to export their own natural gas, liquefied natural gas, to Europe. Uh, it's uh, more than twice as expensive as the Russian gas. And the supply of it is uncertain because it's what's called concomitant gas to shale oil production. There's very little gas-directed drilling in the United States. It's oil-directed drilling. And the oil directed drilling is now uh, has now reached a plateau and will at some point in the next however many months or years begin to decline. So it isn't as if Europe will be supplied with American natural gas forever. So it's really a very sad situation. Um, I think that the only way that Germany in, in the foreseeable future can remain an industrialized country is to come crawling back to Russia and begging it to to fix the pipelines and get the natural gas flowing again. Are we approaching to the point that the U.S. support for this war in Ukraine is going to diminish drastically? At this point, uh, the United States is at an impasse because, uh, first of all, it no longer sees a way of making big profits off of the Ukraine. Uh, remember, the Americans only engage in military action while there's money to be made from it. So uh, the occupation of Afghanistan stopped as soon as fentanyl replaced heroin. Heroin came from Afghanistan. Fentanyl comes from Mexico using Chinese precursors. There was no, no longer any reason to uh, have NATO troops guarding poppy fields in Afghanistan because the stuff can be synthesized so much more cheaply. Therefore, Afghanistan was abandoned. Uh, same thing with the Ukraine. Uh, for a while there, uh, there was money to be made by selling Ukrainian land to, uh, to uh, various uh, uh, American corporations with the hope of making money from it, um, you know, selling lithium mines, basically selling anything Ukrainian that's not, uh, that's not nailed down. Uh, making lots of money off of the sale of weapons that were shipped to the Ukraine, uh, basically sold at face value, even though a lot of those weapons were expired past their use date. Um, so they made lots of money off of that. But now all of that stuff is gone. All of that stuff has been sold at least once. Uh, and the entire military campaign is a fiasco, a failure. So what they want to do is run away and start paying attention to something else. You know, the, Amer the American public has the, the attention span and the memory of uh, a little tropical fish. So uh, basically, you, you can tell it to stop looking at the Ukraine, start looking at Gaza. Oh, no, stop looking at Gaza, start looking at Yemen. Oh, no, start looking, you know, stop looking at Yemen, start looking at Iraq, etc. It's... They can't even remember what the name is, never mind finding it on the map, so that's pretty easy. So that's what they're going to do with the Ukraine now. They're going to memory hole it. They're trying very hard to do it. If you look at the amount of news coverage that the Ukraine is getting in Western press, it's nearing zero. They're, they're basically doing all they, all they can to forget that it ever exists. Because not doing so is, first of all, not profitable. And secondly, it's a gigantic political embarrassment because at some point they have to say that Zelensky, they have to admit that Zelensky is a Russian agent. I mean, look at him. He's a, a Russian Jew, a comedian who got himself elected president, who killed more Nazis than any Jew ever in throughout history, um, basically eliminated several hundred thousand Nazis. 
and and he he's uh you know he, you can't really blame him for not making an effort he learned two foreign languages on the job the first one foreign language is ukrainian because his native is russian he never spoke any ukrainian at all um you know high school ukrainian doesn't count that's like high school french in the united states um and 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 he also uh, now can speak passable English, which is very impressive because he he could barely utter a word of it when he got first elected, and and he, of course he made some money doing it. You know who can blame him? He's now a rich man, um, because he he did all this work, but but eventually but but he was instrumental in 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 making it possible for Russia to defeat NATO. You know, which is quite a feat. I think he deserves one of those heroes of Russian Federation medals now. But it, but given all of that, and given the, you know, the impossibility of denying it forever, he he has to be memory hold. He has to be basically um, deleted from the the public consciousness of people in the West. It's the only thing they can do. Recently at the World Economic Forum, they were talking again about this peace formula of Zelensky. When you look at the World Economic Forum, how do you find it? What's the agenda behind this forum, in your opinion? Uh, the agenda is really all about the the um, uh, the catering and and the escort service and and uh, hobnobbing with uh, rich people like yourself, uh, comparing watches and 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 various other accoutrements um and of course making evil plans for the for, for the end of the world because the uh evil is in you know devil worship is 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 what it's about uh so there has to be some some devilry going on as well you know they have to talk up some some virus that's going to kill everybody or some other thing that is fashionable but it's it's really kind of sad at this point the whole davos thing is rather deflated um you know it's it's still a sort of gathering for for burning through a whole bunch of money but that's pretty much all it is as far as making great grand plans you know uh, uh, i i don't think that that's what's going on there when you look at the Biden administration with the difficulties they're having with the Congress to pass these funds to Ukraine, do you think that was influential to their attitude toward Europe to force them to send more funds and weapons to Ukraine? Well, basically, they they, they could force the Europeans to do whatever they wanted. The problem is that the Europeans can't really do a lot. The, the Europeans don't really have that much to give to the Ukraine. As it was, the Ukrainians uh, were saddled with this incredible mixture, hodgepodge of, of foreign weaponry that they had no idea how to run or how to maintain. You know, the, the Soviet tanks, uh, um, there were a lot of people in, 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 in the Ukraine who knew how to fix one. Uh, when it comes to challengers or or, or to to the other stuff that the the Europeans sent in, um, uh, the it was hopeless. Uh, the, the 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 tanks, the armor, everything else. Also, it wasn't really designed for for the muddy terrain. So a lot of it, when when the bad weather set in, the Russians were just doing fine, but. But all of this uh, foreign stuff bogged down and became useless. For a while there, where the, they were operating pretty much without armor, which caused a lot of a lot more casualties. And and so I I don't think that. I think that the Americans get that can get the Europeans to do just about anything that the Europeans are capable of doing. But I think the problem is that the Europeans aren't capable of much. When you look at NATO right now, how do you find it? They have two new members, Finland and Sweden. And on the other side, we have this division within the NATO. We have Turkey that is totally different view in Gaza. Even with Russia, they're not totally in the game against Russia. We have Orban, we have in Slovakia, we have Fitzo. They are totally against their policy in Ukraine. Do you find NATO stronger or weaker? 
Well, weaker definitely because they they're out of armaments and uh, they've been shown to be uh, pretty much useless uh, against Russia. Um, so that it's it's now down to naked pretense. Oh, Russia is going to attack us. We have to prepare. And then the next step, of course, is for the Americans to figure out what it's going to take for the Russians to attack them, as they did with the Ukraine. What kind of provocation would be needed in order to get Russia to somehow respond? And then they could run around and say, oh, Russia is the aggressor. Russia has attacked. Look at that. And, and respond to that and be defeated as they were in the Ukraine while making some money on the side. I think that that's their entire plan. I don't think it's a plan for victory. I think it's a plan for pocketing some change that that's left. Uh, the whole the whole idea is, oh, we don't we're running out of money. Let's uh, let's stir up some trouble so that we can steal some more. Um, I think that that's that's all it's going to add up to. Uh, Finland is is a good uh, sort of NATO stomping ground for um, for insulting Russia and pro causing provocations. Uh, the Finns are, are, are sort of, um, you know, they, they're they not likely to do anything at all except kind of sit there and get drunk, you know, um, and, and let NATO roll over them. And that's pretty much what they've been doing. Um, and that's that's rather unfortunate. The problem with Finland is that it's it's really rather close to uh, St. Petersburg, which is Russia's second largest city. Uh, on the other hand, Estonia is already in NATO and it's even closer. Um, so um, uh, the Russians are, are beefing up their uh, air defenses, uh, waiting for these provocations. And uh, the Russians have been rather desensitized to these sorts of provocations, little drone attacks and 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 uh, uh, they, they they're not going to start a World War III over these little mm -hmm. mosquito stings. So it's going to take a lot of effort on the part of NATO to 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 stir up some kind of trouble. I don't I, I doubt that they would really succeed. With this war of attrition that we've seen so far in Ukraine, the arm production is one of the key issues in this kind of war. We have two systems fighting each other. The state controls everything in the Russian industrial complex. On the other side, we have American factories and enterprises that have the monopoly of producing arms in the United States. How do you find these two systems fighting each other so far? The, the American system isn't really designed for winning wars. It's designed for maximizing profits. You know, it's written right into the, the charters of these companies. They're all about maximizing shareholder equity. In, in, in fact, it would be illegal for them to do anything else. In, in Russia, the shareholder is the Russian government, and the Russian government wants to maximize just one thing, the defense worthiness of of, of the of the military complex and and so uh, the Russians are very good at producing effective weapons cheaply and the Americans are very good at producing ineffective weapons expensively. Why expensively to minimize shareholder equity? Why ineffective weapons? Well because uh, once you make the weapons it's good if, it, if the weapon breaks down a lot because they, then you can charge for maintenance and replacement. And it's good if it becomes obsolete because then there are reorders. And it's good if, it's, uh, if it becomes ineffective after a short period of time because then you, you, can, you have to uh, start a war to use it up or to sell it to somebody, et cetera, more profits. So the American system is really not designed to win. The Russian system is designed to win, and that is the big difference. Europeans are talking about that they would be capable of producing arms and weapons at the level Russia does in three years. In your opinion, with the situation that they're facing right now, is that possible? With with their, most of their industry uh, at this point redesigned to run on mostly Chinese industrial inputs, now that Russian industrial inputs are uh, 
have been crossed out of the the equation somehow. Um, and um, with the fact that you, you know now uh, all of these uh, products have to uh, circumnavigate Africa in order to reach uh, Europe. It is unlikely that they're going to have the inputs they need to continue manufacturing uh, war material. It, it just seems very unlikely that they would have that level of industrial production. Also, there's the problem that they haven't really uh, trained uh, the hundreds of thousands of workers, skilled workers, that, that it, it would take to ramp up this production. The Russians have been very careful to maintain the numbers of, of industrial workers capable of, 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 uh, of defense work. The Europeans have not, the Americans have not. Uh, there were recent interviews and, and, and film uh, videos from, from inside uh, American munitions factories. And it's just pathetic. The people who work there are past retirement, the equipment hasn't been updated since World War II, and and these are just basically, uh, you know, technological museum pieces. How how on earth do they expect to compete with Russia, uh, based on something like that? You know, is beyond me. The leader of Alternative for Germany AFD just recently said that they're considering Dexit, which reminds me of. Brexit, they're considering getting out of European Union. When you look at these voices, this, this party is getting stronger and stronger in Germany. How do you see the future of this party and Germany? Well, I don't think that that's a possibility because Germany does not really d decide anything like that. You have to understand that the composition, the political composition of, of, uh, of modern Europe is that the there's the United States, the, the sole owner and proprietor of the European project. Uh, and then it's sort of like one of those Russian nesting dolls, matryoshka dolls, one inside another. So outside you have the United States, inside you have NATO, and in, inside NATO you have the EU, and all of it under American control. And, and that's that's how it is. Nothing can happen without the United States allowing it to happen unless the United States falls into complete disarray or if there's great disunity and it's no longer United States, it's disunited States in counties and neighborhoods, ethnic enclaves, et cetera, which might very well happen. You know, the country is on the verge of civil war. If that happens, then suddenly Europe will find itself free and free at last, but what, what will it do with that freedom? Good question. Now, uh, AFD and what, it, what has been happening in, uh, in Germany and in France with all of these protests, um, more interestingly in Germany, because uh, the French are always striking and protesting, et cetera. You know, last time I was in France, I barely made it out because uh, the airport was shut down because of of strikes, you know, and that's typical France. You 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 never know what's going to happen, but Germany isn't, you know, until now has been an orderly place. Germany is very orderly, sehr ordentlich, and uh, now it's not. Now you have these farmer protests. Uh, suddenly the the uh, the railroads don't work. The teachers are on strike. Uh, who knows what'll happen next? And the government, because it's it's basically this marionette government that doesn't decide anything, basically just goes into hiding and reads the same speeches over and over again and doesn't know what to what else to do because it it hasn't been ordered to do anything else from Washington. It has no new orders because Washington is is, is also in disarray. Uh, and if Germany isn't orderly, then all of Europe is going to be in chaos. Because if Germany is the most orderly place in Europe, the rest of it is less orderly. If Germany stops being orderly, then all of Europe becomes completely chaotic and ungovernable. So that's what I wish it would expect to happen. As far as this Matryoshka doll combination of, of US 
and NATO inside it and EU inside it. It can crack from the inside, which is EU starts falling apart and therefore NATO starts falling apart. Or it can crack from the outside, which is um, political failure in Washington, NATO becomes ungovernable, ungovernable and then EU sort of dissipates. Uh, it could go either way, but that's not really predictable at this point, at least not to me. If Russia intensifies the war in Ukraine in 2024, would that influence the Biden's position in this election that we're having in the United States? It definitely wouldn't influence the way dead people vote, because, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of Biden's electorate is dead people. Some of them have been dead for close to a century. I think his oldest voter was last time was over 100 years old, um, well over 100. Um, and some dead people vote over and over again. Um, I don't think it'll have much to do with uh, the way illegal immigrants vote, because that now they'll be probably allowed to vote too. And uh, also, uh, the whole thing might be manipulated by means of some artificial virus that they will release into the wild just ahead of the, the election. You know, sometime like in September, they'll let go this virus and, and, and have the charade around uh, inoculations and uh, shutdowns and uh, electronic voting, no voting in person, et cetera. So Biden, if he's still alive at this, that point, you know, could get reelected no matter what happens in the war. I think, I think that that's their entire plan is to make uh, uh, U.S. presidential elections completely independent of reality, just untie the two. And then the last step there is, you know, Biden is pretty old and might croak at any point. He, 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 he's not going to be alive for that much longer, I don't think. Uh, or at least not, not in a way that can be shown to the public. So I think the best plan would be to um, um, to replace him with uh, some kind of like um, uh, like an artificial uh, intelligence simulation, because nobody would tell the difference anyway. I think um, the most difficult thing with the AI module replacement for Biden would be to teach the AI module to to uh, to confabulate, to make up idiotic stories of things that have never happened. Um, you know, stories of Joe Biden growing up uh, as a, a poor black child in Mississippi or whatever he's going to come up with next. That's relatively unpredictable. That's just human neurons firing randomly, and no AI module can really simulate that. Is the Democratic Party going to replace Biden with somebody else like Gavin Newsom, Kamala Harris at the convention? Is that possible? Of course it's possible. You have to keep in mind that the Democratic Party, Democratic party is not a party. It's, it's a, a private nonprofit corporation. Uh, and uh, the owners of the corporation can make absolutely arbitrary de decisions. It's not, it's not the membership of the party that makes the decisions. It's it's the the board of directors, and we don't even know who's on that board of directors. It's it's really very secretive. So yes, they could do absolutely anything in in their desperation. So uh, yes, on the opening day of the Democratic convention. Joe Biden comes out to make a speech, uh, freezes before the microphone, uh, tries to walk off stage and does a pratfall and lands on his head. So what does the Democratic Party do after that? Well, they, they could trot out Kamala Harris and she would just laugh a lot because that's what she always does when she's nervous. That situation is guaranteed to make her nervous. So all there'll be is just a lot of her non sequiturs and cackling. Or they could somehow press Gavin Newsom in there and force him to, to play his part. I guess they could just threaten him. They, they can threaten just about anybody. Uh, and then would have would have a very frightened presidential candidate afraid for his life for the rest of the campaign, which would be very amusing to watch. 
they could do pretty much anything, but I, I think it's going to be a circus. One way or another, it's it's got to be a circus. Anthony Blinken was trying so hard to convince the Arab nations, Saudi Arabia, UAE, to be part of this, but he wasn't that successful in doing that. And even in Europe, we see France and Germany were not willing to be part of this operation in the Red Sea. This is a huge change. How do you find their policy and their operation in the Red Sea? Well, first of all, um, now uh, the United States and the UK and Israel are one thing as far as the Arab world is concerned. They're terrorists. They're genocidal maniacs. And, and so that, that's an achievement, right? The United States before then wasn't really viewed as a genocidal, maniacal entity by the Arab part of the world. Now it is. So that's something to remember. Second, uh, Suez is now closed to not just Israeli traffic, but Israeli, American, and UK traffic. So congratulations, what a victory that must be for them. They can no longer get ships through there safely. But Russian ships sail through there very well, and uh, a very large share of uh, uh, Russian oil exports uh, from Novorossiysk on the Black Sea is sailing through Bosphorus, Dardanelles, and the Suez, and, and, uh, and, and the length of the Red Sea. Uh, flags waving, uh, Houthis saluting from the shore, no issues at all, because the Russians are are their friends. Um, and and so, what kind of a victory is that? And then uh, the fact that they're shooting at the at the Houthis. Well, um, Saudi Arabia spent years firing rockets and whatever they had at the at the Houthis with absolutely no result. And eventually they gave up because they would fire at them and they would fire back and destroy oil installations. Uh, they're better shots, I guess. Everything that the Houthis have is buried in caves. That whole area is mountainous, riddled with caves. And, and they're very good at, at, at carving tunnels and, and caves, et cetera. Much, you know, much better than what they did in Gaza. So there is really no chance that the very expensive bombardment, you know, at uh, some fraction of a million dollars per rocket uh, is going to do any damage um, to, to the Houthis that will prevent them from being effective in blockading the Red Sea. Uh, so again, it's on the one hand, it's it's profitable because all of those Tomahawk missiles will need to be replaced and they're expensive. So, you know, uh, uh, Raytheon people are rubbing their hands or whoever makes those, I don't remember. Um, because all of that, all of those rockets are being used up and that's a great thing because uh, the Pentagon will have to reorder them. On the other hand, um, it's showing them to be useless and it's not achieving any stated objectives. And, and it is definitely hurting European industry. Now, some people are saying that the Americans are actually trying to destroy Europe. That's why they're doing this whole thing. So they blew up uh, Russian gas lines. Now they're blowing up uh, the Suez Canal. And it's all a, a fiendishly clever plan to destroy Europe. And, and the last part of that plan is to herd the Europeans into some kind of a futile military confrontation, infantry attack on Russia, and that that's what the Americans really want. Uh, I don't know that the Americans really know what they want. I know that they want money. I, I know Americans very well. I've lived in that country for many, many years, and I'm absolutely positive that Americans want money. What else they want? I have no idea. I really have no idea, and I don't think they have any idea either. It seems that Europeans are unified in their policy for these two state solution for this conflict. And in the United States, we've seen that Anthony Blinken was talking about two state solution. But 
the problem is here that nobody in Israel wants that. It seems that the Netanyahu administration is totally against it. In your opinion, why the U.S. president is not forcing enough the Netanyahu administration to get past this two-state solution and solve the situation and solve the problems in that region? Well, um, it, there, there's really a question of, of uh, which entity has primacy in Washington, whether it's the Americans or the Israelis. The Israelis own fully half of the U.S. Congress. Uh, they they own the Democrats because the Jews are in the Democratic Party, most of them, and they own the Republicans because uh, of the uh, um, of of all of the uh, ap apocalyptically minded Christians in the Republican Party. Um, and and so those are on 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 Israel's side too. So the Israelis very cleverly have penetrated and bought out the U.S. political establishment. I think that the that the Israeli thing will crumble once uh, there's really no money at all on the American side, because Israel is a huge uh, American public money sponge. The only reason that tiny country can continue to exist. Uh, is because of very lavish American aid. And and once that aid stops, uh, basically the you know Ben Gurion International Airport uh, will be very, very, very busy uh, until the last Israeli leaves. And uh, the Israeli passport is very useful in in traveling to just about anywhere in the world. Um, and that's that's what people will do. Israel has already lost a half a million of its population because of the, host the ongoing hostilities. And if that keeps going, then the, the place is really going to, to hollow out. You know, those are, those are not the dumbest people in the world. They know what's coming, and they're preparing for it by leaving. So um, I think that that's what's going to happen. I think the final solution for, for Palestine will be a one-state solution a Palestinian state called Palestine. Some Republicans and even the Biden administration, they're talking about bombing Iran. What's behind this sort of policy is something that comes from the Israeli lobby in the United States and they're pushing for bombing Iran or is it connected to the Biden's position in the U.S. election? They want to make him a, a wartime president? Well, first of all, the Israelis have never been, ag been against the United States bombing just about anything. If if the United States wants to bomb something, especially if it's in the Middle East, Israel is in favor. I don't think that there's been a single exception to that. Bomb Lebanon, sure. Bomb Iraq, yeah. Bomb Syria, all in favor. Bomb Iran, well, the only problem there is that the, the Americans aren't going to bomb Iran because they're scared. And rightly so. Um, after all, even the United States can't exist without the Straits of Hormuz being open for operation. And guess who controls that shoreline? Um, so um, I don't. I think Iran is relatively safe, except for maybe some rocket attacks here and there, maybe some assassinations, basically provocations like what we've seen, terrorist strikes. But I don't think that Iran is in any great danger. I think what's going to happen, and what's been happening already, is uh, all of the uh, American military bases in the region are going to keep getting attacked, as they already have. And Americans keep getting killed. And at some point, they won't be able to hide that fact anymore. So for instance, uh, uh, an American military base in Iraq gets hit, and uh, nobody gets hurt except uh, a week or two later, uh, two dozen Americans uh, die in a in a freak skiing accident. That sort of thing has been happening, but there's a, a question in my mind as to how long that sort of cover story remains effective. How many freak tobogganing accidents involving dozens of U.S. personnel um, can you have before somebody starts noticing? 
that you know this is all fake that Americans are basically sitting there and getting getting shot up and getting killed uh, because the Iraqis want them out. And if the Americans leave Iraq, then they can no longer sustain their their, their presence in Syria. And it sets a precedent where just about every other country in the world knows that all you have to do is, is hire some thugs, give them some rockets, shoot at the Americans, and the Americans will leave. And that'll be the end of, of this Pax Americana, this uh, this uh, system of lily pads around the world, military bases that uh, that uh, control supposedly control the entire planet, except they no longer do. And the whole question is, will the Americans uh, still have the money to repatriate all these troops and bring back all, all of this equipment, or will they just abandon the equipment and then we'll have this huge black market for years and years with all of these American weapons being available for, for very cheap, uh, just like with Afghanistan. So abandoning Iraq could look like the way they abandoned Afghanistan. And same thing will go for Syria and same thing will go for various other places where they have military bases. Um, that that seems like uh, a fairly probable course of events. Talking about the U.S. election, Donald Trump right now it's getting stronger because Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis have endorsed him for the U.S. presidential election. How do you find his position right now in the U.S.? It's very unpredictable because a lot of people uh, would basically end up in jail if he gets elected and they know it. So um, they're very much opposed to him being elected, and they will do whatever they can, no matter how nasty and illegal uh, and self-destructive, to prevent that from happening. And and the problem is that uh, the United States is really uh, in the early stages of a, of civil war. The place is so completely disunited and discomb discombobulated politically that nobody can pull it together certainly not biden or any of the stand-ins that they might introduce because he can't do anything and probably not trump either even if he uh, rolls into the white house with uh, a, a new cabinet there'll be so much obstruction from just about every agency and also he he's uh, inherit he would inherit a shambles he would inherit a, a country with with runaway debt and and with with an absolutely untenable position internationally, where uh, uh, there, there is nothing to be won and everything to be lost, and uh, the the defeats would be blamed blamed on him, and uh, uh, I think that you know he he's uh, he's not very deep, you know he's not very studious. He he he's very good at reacting to crowds and feeding off the energy of crowds. He's a showman. But he's not one to sit there and, and and carefully study intelligence briefs and and strategy papers, and and he he doesn't have uh, think tank support behind him, and and all all of the sort of things. So he's hollow, he's he's shallow and he's hollow, and in dealing with an incredibly complicated, tangled set of problems that have been completely mismanaged by an incompetent, increasingly incompetent federal bureaucracy. I don't think that one person or one person backed up by, you know, however many faithful minions he manages to scare up will be able to rectify that situation. I think the United States is heading in a particular direction, has been heading in that direction for a while now, and will continue heading in that direction, no matter who is president. If Trump wins, would he be able to solve the problems between the United States and Russia? Yes. Yeah, I believe he could. Because all you have to do to solve that problem is to start the conversation. If See, what, what Biden has been doing is stonewalling, refusing to talk to Russia, refusing that it exists except, except as, as this nemesis. Um, and making ridiculous proposals that the Russians would never agree to because it's it would be illegal to do so under Russian law. Um, so non-starters. 
uh, all Trump really has to do is call up Putin and and agree to liaise on the military level uh, and on the pl diplomatic level and and basically give orders for the documents to start uh, flowing back and forth with proposals with the idea of a set deadline by which some some workable proposals have to be exchanged and agreed to. And then the, the bureaucrats would have no choice, either resign or call in sick or, or do their stupid job and agree to what is not illegal under international law. And uh, there are very few options. Uh, you basically have to call a ceasefire. You, you basically have to adjudicate the uh, the uh, the territories that that Russia has uh, annexed, because the right of self determination of the people living on those territories is enshrined in international law, and Russia adhered to the letter of the law in annexing these territories. And then you have to figure out the fact what to do about the fact that the Ukraine that the Ukraine is no longer a sovereign entity because it violated the, the UN Charter in denying the human rights of its population in absolutely egregious ways. So basically it has to be more or less dissolved. It has to be made into some kind of a non-sovereign entity and, and there has to be a, some kind of a resolution such as there was a resolution for Nazi Germany after after its defeat in World War II. The situation has to be uh, rather similar. Uh, it may involve partition. It may involve surrender of certain territories, should their populations wish to do that, to, to Russia, made into Russian protectorates. Uh, some, some territories might join Russia immediately. Others might form, might be formed into protectorates that Russia might control, or they might be a, a joint responsibility between Russia and the UN. But those sorts of proposals have to be um, have to be discussed and agreed to. And and so this is a matter of doing the work, which Biden has been refusing to do. And Trump, as far as I I can hear, is not refusing to do that work. He he's actually if elected, likely to force the federal bureaucracy in Washington to engage in this sort of activity.